Hello viewers, I'm Adam Stokes. Welcome back to the channel where it's time we had a good news article with all that's been going on in the world. It can become quite overwhelming. The pandemic is having a huge medical and economic toll on everyone as well as a psychological one. But I come bringing good news. There is some good out of all that is bad. As I mentioned before, the word crisis can also mean opportunity depending which way you look at it. But before we go into the good news article, let's just take a quick look at the headlines coming in from around the world. As we can see that a person coming in from New York writes about how shocked they were with what they saw in Sydney. Australians are now armed with all the information they need to prevent this coronavirus prologue becoming a full-blown tragedy. So why are we still in denial? And that article is about some of the control measures that are in fact lacking from Sydney International Airport. Over to Europe which marks the 25th anniversary of open borders with closed ones. So this is the 25th anniversary of its Shenzhen open border policy, but now the internal land borders are shut or subject to heavy checks to curb the spread of this virus. Going further down the headlines today, what is interesting to me is that I can see, in fact, it is not all about the virus. There are some other articles in here that are containing information, stories about something that is beyond the CV. So that's quite interesting to me. It says that perhaps the news cycle is dying down. Perhaps they've spoken all that they could speak about with respect to the virus. Uh, perhaps there's just more interesting news coming up. In my opinion, uh, things are starting to shift. The world is always moving. Things are always changing. And although things are going to get a lot worse before they get better, certainly the news headlines show that there are some differences in the topics and headings out there. But staying with the CV before we get into the good news story, Australia's unfortunately 13th death has come um, from a cruise ship. A Perth man in his 70s dies after contracting COVID-19 on the Celebrity Solstice cruise ship, taking Western Australia's death toll from the outbreak to two and the national toll to 13. So that's a tragedy and this toll will probably rise and uh, we send our wishes out to that man's family, as well as everyone who's been affected by this terrible, terrible situation. Going down to which states are, on, are going pupil free, leaders announce a series of different measures for schools across the country, with some calling on parents to keep children at home if they can. Down to our safe spaces being at school, our schools are safe places, territory schools are to stay open. So. Premiers across Australia are asking parents to keep kids home from school to prevent the spread in Northern Territory, uh, to prevent the spread of COVID-19. However, in the Northern Territory, it's still up to families to decide. So we can see different laws or different policies, different ways to curb this spread in different states. And of course, the Northern Territory had less cases than others, but that was initially, and there was a lower population in the Northern Territory. And now we can see that the spread is going everywhere. So it's interesting to see how different states are reacting to this. But of course, we've seen before when mass, mass emergency occurs, it is not uncommon for the federal government to step in and saying, to say we are taking the reins. But that is not yet seen. Down to what's happened uh, with the Ruby Princess being responsible for half of New South Australian CV cases. The Ruby Princess is continuing to drive new CV cases in South Australia with half of the last 38 positive tests linked to the cruise ship which docked in Sydney last week. Over to China, as China begins CV recovery, air freight issues leave Australian seafood exporters stuck. Agriculture and seafood exporters say signs of economic recovery in Asia mean little when they can't get their product or planes due to the current huge cost of air freight. So as these airlines pull back in the amount of flights that they're offering, the supply of course has dropped, but the, the demand may not have necessarily immediately dropped in line with it. So we can see exporters who are trying to put goods and services across the world, but there simply isn't the transport to do it. Uh, and that is gonna have, again, a compounding effect on the economic flow, or the economic uh, catastrophe that we face immediately and in the medium and long term. And this leads on to an interesting article about bottle shops and if they can remain open amid moves to limit the spread of COVID-19. The liquor industry, which generates 42 billion for the economy, wants to keep bottle shops open despite the risk posed by CV, saying closures will result in massive job losses. Well, of course, any industry we close is gonna end in job losses, but when you take away people's beer, 
uh, just as you take away anyone's addiction, whether that be cigarettes or drugs or alcohol in this case, uh, it's just another layer of stress or another layer of reaction that the community could face. But before we get on to our good news story for today, we can see how the COVID-19 finger prick test works. So the criteria for who can get, the who can get tested for COVID-19 is growing and the new types of tests are arriving in Australia soon. Uh, we can get these tests now that is a more efficient way of testing for COVID-19. And what is interesting about some of these tests that I've read is that in fact, you can test not so much if you've got it, but if you've had it. And if you've had COVID-19 and we are certain, if we are certain that we can't get it again, you may be, if you will, released back into the community so you can go about your day continuing to work and continuing to generate money for yourself and for the economy. So I won't go any further into the articles today before we get into the good news story, but let's check out what is happening in the markets, noting that we are in many ways economic focused on this channel. So currently Bitcoin is up 6,643 US dollars, slight pullback in the last 24 hours, but in the last seven days, we can certainly see Bitcoin has increased up 6%, nearly 7% in the last week. Over to the gold markets where we can see a shift of consumer confidence where in the last month gold uh, was tracking steady, the CV hit and then everything dropped down quite quickly. But gold appears to be making a solid recovery. So gold is currently sitting at $1,635. Uh, you can probably hear quite loud background noise which should give it clue to where I am in the world or what type of location I am in the world, but I'll leave it at that. Um, about a week ago, on the 21st of March, gold was at $1,498 and it shot up quite sharply to $1,600. So we can see recovery in the gold markets as people are going to exit out of fiat markets and traditional markets. And of course, money is being diluted very quickly in uh, traditional markets as these uh, quantitative easing measures are pushed into the economy, which is essentially diluting everyone's money. I've done many videos about this, these traditional tools that governments will use to try and stimulate economies. They can in fact make the economy much, much worse by falsely trying to stimulate an economy through quantitative easing that in fact hurts everyone in the long term. Silver also looking gold. So silver came in a week ago, looking at the one week US silver markets, Silver came in over the weekend at $12.62 per ounce, currently sitting at $14.40 per ounce. Silver's recovering quite nicely. And over to the platinum markets that took a massive hit, came in on the weekend at $613 US dollars, all the way up to $700. All markets except for fiat and traditional markets are recovering quite nicely, but don't get overconfident. Uh, things can get pretty interesting as the US gets a two do two trillion dollar virus relief in quantitative easing. Two trillion dollars. We used to always work in millions, then billions became the norm, and now we can see trillions is becoming the norm. Before uh, we speak about getting too confident, I also want to mention what was quite interesting from CNN some time ago was that they were saying, do not take your money out of the banks. Now CNN of course has a Fantastic reputation for being completely wrong or saying the complete opposite. England will never end, exit from the EU. England exited from the EU, EU. Trump will never win. Trump won. And now CNN is saying, don't take your money out of the banks because of CV, because the banks are very secure and extremely well capitalized. So I'm not giving financial advice on this channel, but as soon as, well, I've been trying to get money out of the banks for years anyway and push it into other assets. But as soon as CNN told me to take my money out, of, uh, not to take my money out of the bank, that was in fact telling me to take my money out of the bank because whatever the mainstream or CNN says, go the complete opposite and you should be right. This isn't financial advice. All right, good news story. Let's see what's happening around the world with the coronavirus shutdowns have an unintended climate benefit, cleaner air, clearer water. In Venice, the often murky canals recently began to get clearer with fish visible in the water below. Italy's F efforts to limit the coronavirus meant an absence of boat traffic on the city's famous waterways and the changes happened quickly. 
Countries that have been under stringent lockdowns to stop the spread of the CV have experienced an unintended benefit. The outbreak has, at least in part, contributed to a noticeable drop in pollution and greenhouse gas emissions in some countries. Although grim, it's something scientists could offer tough lessons for how to prepare and ideally avoid the most destructive impacts of climate change. So the images I'm looking at now, if you've ever been to Venice, incredible place, mind boggling, but the water was filthy. The water was filthy because it was always being disturbed with um, the amount of traffic through there. And also with all the boats going back and forth, you always get little leakages of fuel. So the water was taking a big hit. But the images I'm looking at now are just mind boggling, especially as I, I can picture Venice quite clearly. It's an incredible place to go to, but the water is crystal clear. It kind of looks like the, the water that you would see in a casino. So if you think of the casinos that do a Venice replica, so you've got them in Las Vegas. I've actually even seen it in, I was in Qatar once and they had a, a fake Venice in a shopping center in Qatar. Uh, and I think uh, in China, I went to a fake Venice in China and the canals there were of course were crystal clear because they were man-made in the sense that they were in a shopping center or in, indoors uh, as opposed to having ocean canals go through them and they're crystal clear. But now I'm looking at real life pictures per se of the Van Venice canals and they are just as clear and full of life, uh, so even better than the shopping centre ones because the, the shopping centre canals didn't have fish in it, but these ones do, so really exciting to see what's happening. And we can also see satellite observations have shown that the tempor uh, temporary measures have also driven significant decreases in harmful emissions. Carbon dioxide is, in, is tied to industrial activity, electricity production and transportation. So anything that affects those sectors will, affect, will impact greenhouse gases as well, Joan says. So there's NASA Earth uh, imagery that I'm looking at now. And if I was back in my studio, I'd be bringing this up on the screen. But because I'm in a reading room with uh, an iPad uh, shooting to you on my phone, I simply don't have access to the technology that I have back in my, my theater, my studio. So I'll just describe the pictures to you. We have incredible satellite imagery of thermal views over uh, China, over Italy, and over other countries where you can see very dark colours, a very dark thermal imagery of what these countries look like when they're operating normally. And now many of these thermal images are completely clear. It's completely neutral as cars are not driving, trucks are not driving, planes are not flying, factories are not pumping out these emissions. And we can see very quickly this cooling effect and the reduction of carbon being pumped into the atmosphere. Now again, this isn't a environmental channel per se, a political channel about the pros and cons, or the beliefs or non-beliefs, I should say, about climate change. Um, but we can see without any doubt, whether you are left, right, up, or down, or believe or non-believe in climate change, these images don't lie. And certainly the ones with the waterways are just mind boggling. The CV first emerged late December in Wuhan, China. As it rapidly spilled into neighboring regions, the Chinese government locked down the city, quarantining 11 million people in Wuhan. Eventually, the lockdown would include almost 60 million people, people in the province of Hubei. Industrial operations in the coronavirus hotspot ground to a halt, and travel restrictions within China meant that air, rail, and road traffic were paused or scaled back across some regions. According to Laurie M., an analyst at the center of for research on energy and clean air in Finland, the restrictions contributed. The restrictions contri contributed to. This is fun to say with a plate. A 25% drop in China's carbon dioxide emissions emissions over four weeks, beginning in late January, compared to the same time last year. That's amazing. Uh, M's analysis also found that industrial operations were reduced by 15% to 40% in some sectors, and that coal consumption at power plants fell by 36%. Pollution monitoring satellites operated by NASA and the European Space Agency observed drastic decreases in air pollution over China over two weeks in February when the quarantine was in effect. The satellite measured concentrations of nitrogen dioxide, which is released by cars, power plants, and industrial facilities from Gen 1 to Gen 20, and again from Feb 10 to February 25. The difference was unmistakable. The cloud of nitrogen dioxide that was parked over China in January seemed to evaporate in February, 
NASA scientists said that it is similar emissions that similar emission reductions have been observed in other countries during economic disruptions that the sharp decrease in air pollution in China during the quarantine period was especially rapid. Quote, this is the first time I have ever seen such a dramatic drop off over such a wide area for a specific event, Fei Lu, air quality researcher at NASA's Goddard Space Facility said in a statement this month. Pollution levels have similarly decreased over Italy, which has become the center of the CV pandemic outside of China. On March 8, as cases spiked, Italy locked down its northern Lombardy region. Two days later, the Prime Minister expanded the quarantine to include the entire country. Concentrations of nitrogen dioxide in the atmosphere over Italy also fell, as they did in China. An analyst and an analysis by the Washington Post found that the most dramatic drop was observed over northern Italy. So I've often spoken about on this channel the balance between economic and the economies and the environment, that is economic growth and environmental impact. I've spoken in previous videos about what happens is as economies expand, the environment takes a hit. And now we can see the opposite of that, but the correlation remaining the same as economies shrink the environment expands or flourishes. So we have this very interesting conundrum in the world, the modern world, where we believe that the only way that we can grow economically is actually at a consequence to the environment. And we can see that with trees being cut down everywhere. Uh, we'll take a, a very basic example. You might have an Amazon forest that is doing very well for the environment. But if you go to the country where the Amazon is sitting, and you say to that country, hey, we can generate millions of dollars for you in the medium and short term by cutting down these trees and selling them on the international market. Well, of course, their economy grows because suddenly there's lots of jobs. They're exporting lots of goods. They're getting lots of people coming through to work for them, pay taxes, and, and the economy is moving. But the downside to that is that the environment is being torn to pieces. So I would like to see in the future instead of measuring an economy's success on just GDP, which is gross domestic product, which is essentially, in simple terms, a calculation of all the production, all the sales of uh, goods and services, exports, imports, a calculation of it all offset against each other to give you a number which is called a GDP, a gross domestic product. I would like to see something like an EDP, which is an environmental domestic product. And I would actually see in the future a GDP and an EDP being offset to give a true score of what that economy is achieving. If we only measure an economy's performance on a GDP and we're missing out on an EDP, which is a term I've just, I guess, made up over recent times, we, we don't get the full picture. A GDP may look good for this year, but it may not necessarily look good for next year. And we can see if we're always trying to achieve economic growth, it will come at a cost to the environment. It is something that we have to achieve a balance in and the good in this whole situation is I think we're all stepping back. We're all stepping back and going, well, hang on a second, what is important to me at the moment? How good is my freedom, my freedom of movement, my freedom of air, my freedom of shopping, my freedom of being able to drink and, and associate with other people, freedom to alcohol, all the freedoms that we take for granted in a figurative sense, like little kids, if we're being locked in our room for being naughty, and that naughty might be overconsumption, taking things for granted, uh, not being wise with our money, as we are all now sent to our figurative rooms, or literally, to be locked away to think about what is going on, to think about how are we consuming, how are we spending, how are we saving, and most importantly related to this channel, how is money working or not working? Now is in fact, I believe, a great time to first of all, pause, slow down and reflect, but secondly, to redesign how we're gonna come out of this. At a minimum, we're gonna redesign how we deal with pandemics. We're gonna redesign how we react to an infection that is spreading around the world. We're gonna look at accountability differently. We're gonna look at how money works differently. We're going to look at the options that are available to us as we move out of these pandemics and other economic collapses. And ultimately, I'd hope that we look at how banks react to this. I do have a solution in economic terms for how we could get out of this, and it doesn't involve quantitative easing. It is a drastic measure, and I have wargamed it 
in an economic scenario, different economic scenarios on paper, on my mind, and on computer simulations over and over again. Uh, the solution that I have would hurt a very few, but the, a significant uh, benefit to the majority of the world, in fact, the vast majority of the world, and would pave a new way forward in the financial, banking, and economic sectors. If you'd like to know what this solution is, hit like and subscribe. If I get enough feedback, I'll probably make it. In fact, I will make a video about it, but don't forget to hit that bell as well so you don't miss when I do release a detailed uh, synopsis or analysis of where we are and how I would, in fact, solve this situation if I was the person in charge. I wish I was in my studio so I could map it out for you. I would create visuals and put charts up and show a flow of how the money is moving and how I could get it to move if I was a guy with all the answers, as most of us may think we are. Uh, this is just a scenario that I've gone through uh, in great depth, uh, again, through computer analysis, thought analysis, and discussion with those who are much smarter than myself. And I believe I have a way forward, and I'd like to share that with you. Anyway, I'm off to the gym because in a time like this or any time, you've got to get back to the basics of looking after yourself, make sure you get enough sleep, make sure you have enough um, food, water, and stockpiles of not being silly, but if the shops do shut down entirely, make sure that you have enough to get through. I'm very impressed with my fellow Australians that have been showing racks, random a um, acts of kindness. Uh, there has been great donations out there, not just in food, but also in time. Don't forget the vulnerable people out there in the society that do need a hand. Come on Australia, come on world, but particularly my Australian brothers and sisters, this is a time that we rally together. We've made, through, made it through much worse than this. This is the chapter in our life that we can look back and be proud of how we deal with this. We rally together, we look after our mates. Uh, we hopefully don't pillage and go crazy when things get bad. We've made it through floods, we've made it through fires, we've made it through cyclones, we've made it through bombings of our country in the Second World War. We will make it through this and we will look back and we will learn a lot from it. Leave your comments below. I'd love to hear what's going on in your world. Throw out a couple of good news stories. Tell me what is good in your world uh, or as frustrating as it may be with everything that's going on. It's time to hear some of the good news stories. Let's stick together. Be strong. Be safe. Thanks for listening. Happy investing. Look for those opportunities. They are really out there. And I'll talk to you next time.